know, let's go off the record until we can fix this. Thank you. Can you say something, Mr. Perone? We're off the record. Back on the record, then. Um, back on the record, State versus Brian Koberger, CR 2922805. I uh, it was explaining explaining how the order and the uh, scheduling conference uh, might go, at least my plan. And uh, so I'm going to start uh, with you, Mr. Carone. Um, your clients have the motion to vacate the amended uh, non-dissemination order filed May 1, also the motion to interview, excuse me, intervene filed May 1, same date, um, and now this case is in my hands, so I uh, need to set a hearing. And uh, I'm wondering how far out. I'd like to get some briefs, and this is a message to everybody uh, before the hearing, uh, including I want to uh, hear arguments about whether or not there should be um, cameras in the courtroom uh, in a high-profile case like this one. So, um, Mr. Carone, what, what looks good for you? And let me throw out knowing that a lot of you were prepared to be here the week of June 26, that might, that might make sense. But uh, I'll hear from you. Mr. Perone? Hey, yes, Your Honor. So with, with our motion to be Kate, motion to intervene, we briefed the merits issues there. I think as the court's aware, we also briefed those issues uh, before the Idaho Supreme Court. So I would think we could be ready to move pretty quickly. Uh, we have not briefed the issue about video cameras in the courtroom, so if that's something that you'd like the media coalition to weigh in and in on as well, um, we would need to submit a separate brief on that, but we can do that in the week of the 26th. The 26th itself, I'm not available, but the rest of the week would work. Excellent. And uh, I'll tell you, the reason that I'm bringing up uh, cameras in the courtroom is uh, because if I address that issue, and I haven't let you all know that that might be an issue, uh, then uh, I'm going to get a lot of grief uh, for not allowing you to brief that issue. So that's why I'm, I'm giving you an advance uh, notice on that. Um, how do you feel about the afternoon of June 27? 
Uh, given what's happening just quite recently, we might want to do that in person. Uh, I'm willing to do it uh, remotely, but then we have to... There, there are a lot of different interests and different people who want to weigh in on that, so it might be better to be in person. But uh, Does that work for you, say, starting at 1.30, June 27, Mr. Carone? Yes, Your Honor, that works for me. Ms. Olson and myself can both come in person. Uh, we would have been there today in person, but we just we found out about the in-person option on Friday, so I apologize for using Zoom today, but we can certainly be there in person. Uh, if the court's anticipating hearing from with witnesses that day to hold an evidentiary hearing, there may be some witnesses that would want to appear via Zoom if that's okay with the court, but I'm not sure if that's even something you're contemplating. I'm just flagging it in case you are. Well, let me put it this way. It's, it's, your, it's your motion and others' motions. Uh, and uh, one of the complaints that I've seen in the briefing is that there's no evidence in the case supporting any of it. You know, we're all, we're all kind of uh, moving forward on uh, supposition, I guess. Uh, and some of it is obvious, but I think uh, that would be wise. Um, I suppose you could just uh, file declarations, and that's what's been do doing, that, how that's been going. I might, if we're going to have a lot of testimony, I might want to move this back to 10 a.m. just to make sure that we have enough, enough uh, time to get things finished that day. Would that work for you? Sure. So, so our position on the, on the evidentiary issue is your summary was correct that we don't believe that there is an adequate factual record at this point. Given that it is our motion and it's based on the record that existed when the order was issued, procedurally I'm not really sure there is an opportunity for uh, additional evidence to be put forth. I only brought that up because I saw in Mr. Koberger's opposition to our motion for reconsideration that there was a mention of an expert witness. If that evidence was going to come forward or other evidence, we of course would want the opportunity to cross-examine uh, that individual or whatever individuals might be testifying. But, you know, as things currently stand for the record as it exists and the evidence that the media coalition intends to put forward, uh, we included a declaration with our motion. Uh, I'm not sure there's really a need for us to put on additional evidence, but if that's something the court was going to hear from the state or Mr. Koberger, then I just wanted to bring that to the court's attention. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Cor Corona. Uh, of course, you'd be, uh, have the opportunity to cross-examine any witness. All right. Um, well, we'll we'll stay at 1:30 then. So um, now, uh, Mr. Gray. So I'm I'm thinking that maybe we should keep these things together and do them the same day if that works for you and your clients. Uh, well, Your Honor, I see the issue very clearly different from uh, the AP's motion versus my motion. Uh, I think their motion is more of a getting rid of the non-dissemination order, the gag order. My motion is a motion to amend and or clarify some of the issues in the gag order. They have a lot of constitutional different issues that we have. I have some issues that I think are very separate. So I would request a hearing on my own uh, much sooner. Um, I think the court's where I filed this motion in February um, on this case. and. There was a massive delay based on the fact that the uh, previous judge, Judge Marshall, was waiting for the Supreme Court to get some clarification regarding the AP's motion that she filed with the Supreme Court. So I'm ready to go when the court's ready to go, but I think our issues are very, very different than that of the AP's uh, motion on this case. So I would request a hearing much sooner within, uh, I can do it by the end of this week. All right. Well... Um, and I, I recognize this was all pretty short notice for everybody, um, and I, I don't know if, um, let me go back, let me go to Mr. Radley and then uh, Mr. Um, Logsdon, because they're going to weigh in on that motion as well, I'm assuming. I'm thinking about maybe June 9th would be the soonest uh, I could do this. But uh, let me...
Let me go to you, Mr. Boston. Your Honor, we'd be ready to go and would expect to put on an evidentiary presentation for that week of the 26th. To the extent that uh, Mr. Gray wants to have his motion heard ahead of time, and just based on what I've read in it, I mean, obviously, if the court were to agree with some of the things that he says, into the, into the mic, I guess. Sorry. Obviously, if the court were to agree with some of the things that he says and winds up amending the order, that could change everything for everybody else. So to some extent, I think it actually uh, is probably better to do them all at the same time so the court isn't in piecemeal uh, changing what we're all arguing about. But uh, I would be ready for the ninth if the court chose to do it that way. No, no judge likes to do things piecemeal. Um, but I also understand that uh, Mr. Gray and his clients have been waiting for a long time. Now, I, 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 there's no, it's not anybody's fault. It's just how that came down because uh, the Associated Press at all went straight to the Supreme Court in February, early February. And that, that would trigger a, a delay, which it did. Um, and it was important, I think, for the uh, for Judge Marshall to get the direction from the Idaho Supreme Court before we start, you know, chipping away at each at each order. Uh, so um, I don't know if you would you be. I mean, I'm I'm okay setting it for June 9th, Mr. Gray, but. Uh, you, you may have some testimony uh, happening. You may want to wait until you hear what everybody else is saying. Uh, it's likely that there's there's going to be some uh, adjustments, you might say, or clarifying in the in the order. Uh, partly in my reading of the Supreme Court's decision, there's I, I, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but there were some hints maybe of what uh, what the trial court might want to consider, okay? Go ahead, Mr. Bray. Well, I was going to say, that since this is your gag order now, this non-dissemination order, Your Honor, um, yeah. and in reading my motion, uh, if the door court does want to consider making some of the modifications that might have been suggested in my motion, it may be, my motion may end up being moot. I think some of my modifications and or clarifications to the non-dissemination order are fairly minor. Um, uh, but allows, and I think the Supreme Court did give some guidance, which I think added weight to my arguments and my motion. So it, it's not above the court to have a take a look at my motion as well as any other motions that have been submitted to the court and modify the non-dissemination order, um, allowing uh, for some of the issues that I've discussed in my motion, and then and then you would only have the AP who are attacking, I think, the gag order as a whole, the non-dissemination order as a whole. I'm just um, addressing a couple of clarifications and amendments that would allow myself as an attorney to speak on behalf of my clients that, um, regarding the non-dissemination order. And I think it's, it, you're, it's, it's your order now, so it's, it's, you're more than apt to be able to go and make those changes, and then we wouldn't have an issue with the non-dissemination order at all. So. I don't think that's, so obviously the ninth, I'd like to keep the ninth because my issues are very small and narrow regarding the non-dissemination order, but if you were to make changes to those ahead of time uh, that I was able to review and we were, it was acceptable, I would withdraw my motion, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Thank you. Well, I'm, it would be highly unlikely for me to change the order before I hear from counsel um, because I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, Third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Um, I, don't, I only want to do this once, um, and I'm I'm happy to set it for June ninth, maybe uh, ten thirty. Does that work for you? That does, Your Honor. Okay. Does that work for you, Mr. Rudley? Yes, Your Honor, it does. Okay, uh, Mr. Logston. We'll make it work, Judge. Okay. Let's do that in person. Okay. So. So now we have the June 9th to 10.30. We also have the uh, a 
Associated Press at all on June 27th at 1.30. I assume that works for you, Mr. Redley? It does, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, excellent. Yes, Mr. Corona. Your Honor, I apologize. I may have misunderstood your what you said earlier. I was understanding that the week of June 26th was when you the court was first available. But if the court is available to hear our motion earlier, we would be available on June 9th as well. I know that our most recent motion is pending more recently, but obviously we've been challenging this since February as well. And it's our position that the non-dissemination order violates the Associated Press and Media Coalition's First Amendment rights. Those constitutional violations are irreparable. So we would like our motions to be heard as soon as possible as well. If I suggested otherwise by agreeing to the week of the 26th, that was simply because I misunderstood that that was when the court was first available. Okay, thank you. Only one thing I'll say about that. Irreparable harm goes both ways. And so I was a little bit troubled by that claim without considering the Sixth Amendment considerations. I mean, you know, this is a balancing. The law is clear on this. Okay? It's a balancing test. And when your client says that he's arguing it as the First Amendment is absolute, it's also troubling. So I would suggest that maybe the Associated Press needs to tone it down, just ratchet down a little bit. Because some of the arguments, including the first line in the motion to intervene, says that the court, the Supreme Court, held a certain thing that I do not think that that is what the court held. And you know the difference in a holding of an appellate court. So I just felt obligated to help you out a little bit in terms of what the Associated Press is asking for. And in the meantime, there's a lot of potential irreparable harm from media that is affecting a fair trial. So that is really concerning. This is a very high-profile case. So I'm happy to set this on June 9th, too. Okay? How about we set yours at 1.30, though, so we don't kind of push them all together. Does that work for you, Mr. Rudley? It does, Your Honor. Okay. Does that work for you, Mr. Logsdon? Your Honor, I don't know if we'll have an evidentiary presentation ready by the 9th. That would be my only concern. We can certainly try. Well, let's see. And if that doesn't work out for you, then we'll talk about it. Okay? I just felt the obligation to talk about irreparable harm. Okay? It's all – there's a lot of interest here, Mr. Carone, and I think my job, my constitutional responsibility, is to consider all of the potential irreparable harms or all the injuries or all the harms. So, you know, I just want – maybe it's appropriate. I was just thinking, you know, I just want to remind everybody, okay, on this particular issue, but all issues at all times, that we all, okay, judges, lawyers, journalists, media generally, have constitutional responsibilities to both the First Amendment and the Sixth Amendment. And what I see – what I generally am seeing in the newspaper and the media is no discussion about the importance of the Sixth Amendment. It's just the First Amendment, which is very important. But here's the real reminder. The first sentence of the preamble of the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct says that a lawyer 
as a member of the legal profession, is a representative of clients, an officer of the legal system, and a public citizen having special responsibility for the quality of justice. We all have that responsibility. And sometimes we, uh, we push in a, in a hard way for our clients, and that's appropriate. But you have, you have larger responsibilities at the same time. Okay, so we got a hearing, 1030. Uh, that's for um, the Gonzalez family with Mr. Gray. 130 is the Associated Press at all uh, with Mr. Carone. And I think that deals with all the pending motions uh, for you, Mr. Gray, you articulated what your motion is. So we've ad addressed that. Correct? Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, okay. Your Yes, Your Honor. You're welcome. And uh, Mr. Carone, those two issues are out, are, that are still uh, outliers on uh, your clients, I think that's all we have, the motion to vacate the amended uh, non-dissemination order and the motion to intervene. Uh, anything else that we need to address for your clients, Mr. Perone? No, Your Honor, unless um, you mentioned the, the broadcasting issue as well. I'm not sure if you're going to set a uh, separate briefing schedule for that. Obviously, for the motions, they'll follow the normal the briefing schedule. Since we haven't followed that yet, I just didn't know yes. uh, when exactly you wanted that briefing. I'm going to send a briefing schedule out uh, for everybody. And now, okay, if we're going to do it on June 9th, you ha don't have very much time to do those briefs. So that's why I was thinking it made a lot more sense to do it at the end of June. But if you all think you're ready to do that, I'm willing to hear it. But I want, I want those, uh, those briefs. Um, we'll say by June 2nd, response briefs will be due by June 6th, and any reply briefs due by June 8th. So that's going to be rapid briefing. I'm just trying to accommodate everybody, okay? I got a lot of interests floating around on these issues. Without forgetting, uh, Mr. Coburn is primary in this case right now. All right, so let's move to, and I mean, anybody who's um, here for Associated Press or uh, Gonzalez uh, family can be excused if you'd like. We're also happy to have you stay. No problem. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Perrone. All right, so what we have now between the parties uh, is motion to compel, which we're moving out. That was kind of a on and off uh, hearing. Uh, disclosures of grand jury materials uh, while protecting those materials from the public extension time to file pre-trial motions after receiving materials from grand jury. I believe those are the motions that we have outstanding. Is this, uh, are you arguing these or scheduling these, Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, I'll, we can schedule all of those hearings. Okay, when do you want, when do you want to do this? Your Honor, I think that if the court has June 26th, we can do that. We will be ready to address that round of motions on June 26th. Excellent. We'll have that 1.30 on June 27th because the, uh, the Associated Press moved that to the night. June 27th is just fine for us. Right? Okay, perfect. Well, 1.30. 
Okay. Um, is there anything else we need to address today, Mr. Rudley? Mr. Thompson? Um, Your Honor, I think the June 27th should work fine. For whatever reason, our office hasn't seen copies of the grand jury pretrial motion motions, but I think there was a miscommunication. Those will be coming. We'll be prepared. Okay, great. And certainly, if those uh, issues are resolved between counsel, then we won't have to have a hearing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, anything else we need to address today, Ms. Taylor? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Lawson? There. Thank you. Okay. Great. So, I think um, Ms. Ms. Massif. Uh, has been observing on Zoom. I just wanted to identify her and also Ms. Uh, let's see. Oh, I guess uh, Ms. Beatty is too. So anyway, there are other people on the Zoom. So thank you. Okay, anything else then? No. Okay, thank you all. Thank we you, are Doug. adjourned. Okay. Ryan Koberger exiting.